business you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 30% off your new account for three months, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE3. The Golden Rule Never let any hint of menace be displayed. The menace must remain phantom. First off, never point your saber towards anyone. You might hurt them. Aim to the side of them. Then, even if your opponent strives to miss you, dodge his blows. You can never be too careful. A recap. Aim to the side. Dodge as a precaution. Aim to the side. Dodge just in case. Squint and aim. Bob down exaggeratedly. Bot your rank. Make a show of your dodge. Aim like a drunkard. Jump like an idiot. And now the title of the show is Frame Rate. Welcome to Frame Rate episode 68. Have we done 68 of these? I'm Tom Merritt. I can't hear you, Brian. Good. You don't want to hear me. You're just going to listen to idiocy flapping out of these gums. I was saying we're old enough to qualify for Social Security, which is why I'm drinking tea today. Well, I will will join you that old man. Uh, (laughs) As I cash my pension check. Mm. (laughs) I say, where's your monocle, sir? Uh, Well, welcome to Frame Rate, episode 68, ladies and gentlemen. And I call you ladies and gentlemen because you are actually part of the 1%. You're genteel. Just by watching this show. And you're very handsome and tall. We forgot to mention that. That is true. Uh, So that was uh, an actual Skywalker sound mastering on no, that uh... no 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 you're reading the wrong intro oh I'm, i am i'm cross-eyed i'm sorry <laughs> this uh, this is the totally phantom menace corrected version look for it on youtube you'll see it basically this guy takes the one thing that was supposed to be good about the prequels Remote and assails it where he points out that if you watch it's obvious that nobody's actually trying to hit either <laughs> how they're just trying to hit the <laughs> that's pretty it's, it really is. yeah yeah it's pretty awesome points out the gaps and everything how nobody he basically uh, uh, keeps a long-standing, decades-long tradition of of crapping on something we wanted to love. Yeah, and, and you know what? The the stage fencers, the people who are really like into this sort of thing, are like, "You idiot! Of course that's the way we do it. We do it on purpose because it looks right when you do it on film, and you're just picking it apart." Yeah. Well, at this point, we're all piling on. Sorry, George Lucas. Yeah, it's not George's fault. Don't blame George. Yeah, it's, all, it's all George's fault. Every. Everything is. Have you not paid attention to the internet? Did you know? Actually, everything that you, every appointment you have, you have to blame on George Lucas now. Yeah, I think you're right. Actually, now that I think about it, sad, sad, really uh, unfortunate. But it's the burden that he must bear, and the burden we must bear is bringing you the big story. This just in: the big story. I don't know enough about the advertising industry to tell just how huge this is, but it sounds very hopeful to me. I actually emailed Derek Chen, who's kind of our go-to guy on advertising issues, and he said he was trying to brush up on it as well. He knows some people who are interested in this, and he said he will send us an email correcting us when we get everything wrong. But Nielsen, the folks who do television ratings, uh, say they are ready to sell what many advertisers have been clamoring for, a system that standardizes ratings for television and online ads together. Yes. So if I have a campaign where I'm sponsoring show or shows, I can find out how many people saw them not only on the television, but on the internet as well. And the big problem up till now is counting the eyeballs differently. When I saw your ad on the computer screen or even over the internet on my television, it was counted differently. Now Nielsen is creating a combination of this. Now, this is something that that we've been clamoring for for a long time, but I'm afraid it might be a case of be careful what you wish for because whenever 
whenever we've seen uh, large scale studies, the, the fact is the vast majority of eyeballs still are watching most programming real time on the fat dumb pipes in the traditional broadcast networks. Uh, so I what I'm hopeful is that they realize that that not only do uh, many more people watch online ads than they had previously thought, but I hope that they see a deeper penetration as far as getting their message across, because that's going to attract higher dollar ads to the new media format. But you're right. This is a case where we suspect this is a really good thing for new media because at least it's being considered in the same space. And in fact, if I was going to lay a bet, I'm going to say that this is going to really surprise advertisers and end up being a real boon to online media crossing fingers. Well, yeah, my, my big hope has been for them to say, look, we don't care if you're watching Fringe on Hulu or watching it on cable. You're watching Fringe. You're seeing our ad. We're going to count you in the ratings. And, right. and I, I'm not 100% sure that's what this does, but I'm hoping that's what this does. Because you want that combination of, of the old media and the new media, that union of the snake that allows us to only watch stuff and not have to worry about where we're watching it. It still counts. Yes. Well, and, and the important thing also is that in order to know whether – or not something's effective, you have to start measuring it. This is the first step from a scientific stand standpoint. Um, and uh, and I think that this is this is an important decision. I think it's about two years late. I think they should have been looking at this a long time ago. But at some point, it's, it's, it's good to see that the wave of change is so far along now that even a, a longstanding uh, organization like the Nielsen Rating finally acknowledges, yes, okay, we need to unify this. This is the way a lot of people are watching. And only more people are going to watch content this way. Yeah, I, 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 re I just, I wish I knew more about what this product actually is because I, I feel like it is the great hope. Well, and again, the key is uh, that uh, that uh, what did it say? Uh, watching them, uh, unifying them together. I guess this the, the quote from Steve Hasker, the president for Media Products, uh, says this measure will show you the reach of your campaign on TV, the reach of your campaign online, and will show you more importantly the overlap between the two. Uh, this is this is hugely important because remember the only way new media can enjoy uh, the the benefits of of old media is if advertisers understand the value they're getting for their dollars in there. Yeah, if, if the advertisers can say, look, I'm buying, I'm buying your show. I don't care where it shows. If I, right. as a watcher, see it, I get your ad message. What confuses me is they're talking about campaigns. And I know that Nielsen ads for television are meant to break the ads, not so much the actual shows. So I get, I'm, just, I'm thinking this is exactly what I'm hoping it is, but I don't know if it's some sort of other advertising rating system that I was previously unaware of. But that's uh, that's we'll keep an eye. We'll we'll, we'll wait, wait for, for Derek to tell us. Yes, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. Let's move on to another big story. Stop everything! It's another big story. According to data from Comscore released on Friday. Time spent viewing on YouTube is way up year over year. In fact, for all Google-owned sites, which when you're talking about video, YouTube is the primary one, unique users for the month of February increased year on year about 5%. You know, not, not, not a crazy increase, increased a little bit. But the average time users spent watching video on Google sites jumped by 60% to 418.2 minutes over that same period. And Paid Content's Daniel Frankel says that's a sign that the audience is beginning to tune in for longer periods of time, the result, at least in part, a function of YouTube's decision to offer more compelling, longer-form content. Okay, I, I don't know that they can necessarily intuit the one from the other because as I'm reading it, all it's saying is that people are spending more time watching online video. They might still be, watch, instead of watching five 60-second clips, maybe they're watching 560-second clips. That doesn't necessarily indicate, I, I don't think, I mean, I'm hopeful considering, especially for the programming we're doing here at Twit, for example, I know a substantial amount of our Game On audience watches it on YouTube, and that's that's uh, 45 minutes to an hour-long show. So I hope this is correct. I don't know that you can necessarily... You assume that that's the case, though. Well, YouTube uh, executives say that the site redesign, which directed traffic towards the longer form professional content, uh, uh, made, meant the channel subscriptions are up 50% since December. So I think you can speculate. Obviously, like this is not ironclad, but it seems logical that if you have this sudden 60% jump, what's more likely? The fact that we have added a lot of longer form content and made it easier to find it 
or that people suddenly changed their behavior and started watching 60 pet vi skateboarding videos instead of five. I, yeah, I, no, that's, I that's think fair it's enough. quite likely that it is the longer form content. But, but, but I, don't, I don't know that it's either one or the other. I suspect that it's going to be the case where it's a combination of the two. I think people are watching more individual videos on YouTube this year than they're watching last year. Uh, and, and I also believe that they're watching it for a longer period of time. But, but to me, the, the jump that is just automatically the longer form content, especially... 60%, since, Brian. I know it's it's I, I agree. I think that I, agree, I think that I, comes I, from I your average video time going up. Yeah, but but I think you're right. I think you're right in saying it may not be quite as good as it sounds. In other words, yes. like people I don't may think it's be just the one thing. Is all I'm saying you, you can't think, say necessarily people are sitting there and watching all of this new YouTube content from beginning to end. They may be spending more time sampling the longer form content too. That that could happen as well. Right. Well, it, it could. Yeah, exactly. It could be that that the same longer. Oh, plus, also, we're pretty young into this long form initiative, aren't we? I mean, outside there's a couple of channels and I'm sure we'll talk about them. There's a couple of channels that are announced now, but I can't really think of any in the last six months that would that would justify this particular change. Well, yeah. But then again, there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes that I don't know about. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I'm not going to hide the fact that I am part of one of these channels. It was just announced. You're over the one weekend. of them. I, yeah, I, I'm doing a, a video version of the Sword and Laser show on Felicia Day's Geek and Sundry Network. Uh, and one of the things I noticed when we launched is the YouTube interface, while it's, it's, it makes it easier to find stuff, it, it isn't obvious what are the new channels. Like, I'm looking for some of the things that have launched already, and it's kind of hard to find them. It's all mixed together. I would like it to be easier to identify, like, oh, here's our longer form funded professional content, and here's the content well, but, but you also to know and love. Keep in mind that that's a delicate dance YouTube has to watch because if they promote it too hard, then they get accused of no longer being completely decentralized. Then they start looking like they're trying to act like an ABC or CBS where they're saying these are the anointed programs you must watch. So I understand that it's a little bit difficult and I understand why they would rely on, look, you guys setting up this channel. The reason you were picked is because we trusted you to promote, develop and run your own miniature network under our umbrella. So I think I think that's a smart decision on YouTube's. Uh, part, especially since there's been zero backlash from this investment. Everyone's been excited about it. I think if they were to overpromote it, there would be backlash from people. Yeah, you're right. You don't want to overpromote it. But what I, what I find hard to find is the difference between the little two-minute funny videos and the longer-form content, whether it's actually part of YouTube's funding or not. It's just it's difficult to tell it apart. Uh, still, so I, I, I kinda... it, would be, it would be interesting if they eventually started to educate the masses with uh, with uh, some uh, some I don't know like like ideograms, little tags that you could put on it, so that at a glance you could understand what type of clip you're watching. Whether this is virally, you know, like an exclamation with a triangle to indicate that it's going viral this minute, uh, something to, to indicate whether it's a long form, short form, uh, or and and then also, uh, you know, I'd love to see more Reddit like features giving you a blueprint of what people are thinking about these clips as they go and and that's something that could, you know google's big on stuff that can scale automatically there's no reason that that can't be totally an algorithm that 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 gives kind of a a, a virtual social uh thumbprint of what you're getting for each video before you even look at it and and with all seriousness seriousness uh i want to point out that you know while i am doing a show for the geek and sundry network i am not uh an employee of youtube i'm not a stockholder in youtube I no. am, I am, we are getting paid to do Sword and Laser by Geek and Sundry. Geek and Sundry right. is getting funded by YouTube. So there is a connection there, but I'm not directly it, it is, involved. It is very, very important to make it totally clear that everyone needs to watch the new Sword and Laser video weekly series at Geek and Sundry. YouTube.com slash Geek and Sundry. Very important that you check it out. From the award-winning Sword and Laser team of Veronica Belmont and Tom Merritt. I agree, Tom. It is very important. I would. I, thank you. <laughs> That's very nice of you, and I, I'm really horrible at promoting myself, so I appreciate you doing that. But that wasn't my point. My point was for the people out there like, oh, so everything you say about YouTube is either inside knowledge or influenced by them. I have no inside knowledge. Right. Uh, and and I am influenced by them indirectly, and I'll admit that, but not directly. I don't. They're not paying me, so I just want to make that ob yeah, clear. Yeah. So for all of you out there accusing him of having a conflict of interest, you need to go watch Sword and Laser <laughs> on Eaton <Eaton's> Sunday. <laughs> all right. Let's move on to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. 
All three media, you probably never heard of them. Maybe you do if you if you follow Hollywood. Uh, they are a super indie, according to paid content, TV producer. Uh, they have done shows like Skins, uh, The Only Way is Essex, Midsummer Murders, Darren Brown, Peep Show. Uh, so, you know, some indie hits in there. And they are launching a paid app on the Samsung and LG smart TVs that will deploy 230 hours of television shows from their catalog to the app. So you buy the so, app, you can watch it only on these television shows, but it's it's the first example I've seen anyway, I'm not saying they're the first ones ever to do it, but of a large television producer taking their catalog that they own and saying, we're not going to give it to broadcast for syndication, we're not going to give it to cable networks, we're going to put it straight into an app. I think this is a great idea and part of me wants to roll my eyes and say, in the good old Samsung app marketplace, which is like, I don't even know, I have a Samsung TV, which I assume can install these apps on it. I wouldn't know even how to go about this. I'd be surprised if they get a thousand subscribers on this. I think this is the tiniest toe in the water just to see if anyone hits them as they try to dip farther and farther in. And it's a good baby step, but, uh, but man, what a small baby step it is. Uh, I mean, how, do you even know how you would pay for this or what? Does it even say what it would cost? You know, I don't see the cost listed in any of the articles. It, uh, so they may it not does have... say that, that payments will be processed by pay wizards and uh, all three media's app is produced by easel.tv. And that's pay just wizard about this. A company, and, and, by the way, uh, Brian's not just making that up like there will be wizards. That, that's no, the, that's the name of the service. <laughs> In case anyone was confused. You have to actually climb a mountain and ask <laughs> to, to see the content from all three media as the past. Uh, well, all three media's commercial director, Andy Taylor, is quoted in the press release saying uh, that the primary business will continue to be the licensed programs to broadcasters, video on demand, Netflix, Hulu, those kinds of places. But this will allow them to experiment with different payment models to get closer to the viewers. So I think, I think you hit it on the head, Brian. This is a toe in the water saying you know what, we don't want to threaten this business model that we've been using for a long time, but let's try this out. Let's see how it works. Let's learn from this in a very small arena uh, that won't threaten anything, but will get us a little bit of data and usage and how, how people would use this. Do you think, uh, I, I think, uh, which do you think it's more of, that they want to learn so that they can make a bigger jump later, or do you think it's just to see if anyone yells at them for, for starting forward with this? It's probably both. They probably want to. They probably want to test the waters in order to get their other partners used to the idea that they're going to do stuff like this, so that they can make it a little bigger next time, and to see how successful it is with the viewers. Well, again, if if nothing else, this indicates that we have a long history with frame rate ahead of us as media slowly merges with uh, with the new opportunities. Yeah, another union of the snake. All right, uh, let's take a break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. I love Squarespace.com. Uh, Never use, heard of it. Tell me use, about it. Uh, speaking of the sword and laser show that you were mentioning earlier, Brian, I use Squarespace for sword and laser to, uh, to publish our episodes. Uh, in fact, Veronica and I were hastily on our iPads backstage at WonderCon this weekend typing up the announcement post so that we could post it right before we went on stage and then all the announcement would be made at the same time. That's amazing, dude. That's that's and and I think that's one of the underappreciated aspects of Squarespace is the ability to use their app not only for making posts while you're remote or especially imagine if you whatever website you have right now. Imagine somebody makes an announcement about your hiring or firing or some when news breaks, you want to be able to respond instantly. And with a lot of uh, other services, you can't do that, especially if you're actually, you know, HTMLing on your own site, which is like, wow, what's it like back there? in 1999. But uh, for me, the thing I dig about it is whenever something went viral uh, on, on Shwood.com, this uh, letter exchange teller tweeted out this letter exchange between the two of us, and it just exploded, which means I got all these comments. And also, all of a sudden, I realized, like, man, there's a lot of spam comments, and I was really embarrassed. I was able to go in and eliminate all the spam from my comments using the Squarespace app. And if you're out there saying, like, I don't want to have to use some iOS app. Well, they've got Android apps and the apps have the same features. So it's across platforms, phones, tablets. Uh, you, uh, They've added Google's complete web font library recently. I didn't realize that. Wow. 300 fonts now yeah. fully integrated. And they've got great design templates. Uh, as we've talked about before, it's the best way to make your site look good. 
if if you're tone blind or or design blind like I am, uh, but you can also get in there if you if you're good at design and tweak the CSS, use their templates as a starting point. So go go there, import your blog today. Free trial, data portability. You can take the data out if you don't like it. You don't have to give them a credit card to try it. There's no reason not to go start a Squarespace blog right now to see if it's for you. And if it is, use the offer code FRAMERATE3 and get 30% off for three months. That's squarespace.com. Use that offer code FRAMERATE3. We thank them for their support of FRAMERATE. And now it's time for the Slipstream. So this was uh, late last week. A bunch of stories came out saying that with the Walmart launch of Ultraviolet, which we talked about last week, where you can bring right. in your DVDs in a basket. Which, uh, by the way, I'm I'm kind of I'm I'm backing off on. I mean, it's like I'm gonna I'm still I still think it's a bad idea in general. But somebody pointed out to me, like, uh, remember, this isn't Ultraviolet's decision. This is Walmart's decision trying to lure its customers into Ultraviolet and the type of people. Uh, Walmart's the number one. DVD seller in the in in the United States, and if Walmart calculates that the type of people who aren't very technical, who just want you know they they buy their disc, they take it home, like for those people who don't understand all the computer gizmo, maybe this is a good uh, ritual to make them understand. Now you have these movies anywhere you go. So I don't know. I'm I'm actually I'm not. I mean, for for us, I think it's a stupid stupid idea. But Walmart's not dumb, and they they sell a lot of DVDs, and if they think it's a important to make people bring in their dvds maybe that's that's a good idea i don't know i will give you that it is it is not a bad idea to say like it, same way with cds right where we say like yeah you can rip all your cds yourself in itunes and store them but there are services out there where you just give them that your 500 cds and they'll rip them for you and give you a drive back and that's worth it right because it saves you time and it saves you money and if you're looking at the walmart hassle. thing that way yeah, it's not time money and hassle, uh then it makes sense but there's another part of this equation, Brian. This, when you say, like, well, this is Walmart's idea, but it was the industry's idea to push for, push for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and to not allow exceptions for you to rip your own DVDs and make it difficult, not impossible, to make fair use backups of your own DVDs if you want to. So you don't have any legal choice at this point if you want to play by the letter of the law and make a copy of your DVD, this is, this is what you can do. You can drive to the Walmart. That's the only choice you have, whether you're tech savvy or not. That's the part that bugs me. If this was just like, right. hey, you know what? You, you, go, you own your DVDs. You can rip them yourself. That's fine. But if you want to make it easy and be part of this cool ultraviolet thing that makes your, makes your you know, movie a cloud-based thing that you can watch on lots of devices, I'd be all, I'd be all for it, right? I get it. Right. But there is this sort of like, yeah, and by the way, if you did want to do this yourself, that's against the law. Now, there is, you know what, um, Rob Bishkiza at uh, Boing Boing was pointing out there is a fair use exemption for ripping DVDs that was issued by the Library of Congress. He was arguing that that gives you a loophole, but the way I read it, it only gives you a loophole for educational uses. I guess he's arguing that, like, you could just say, like, hey, it's an educational use for me and my family and get through the loophole. But I, I feel like, you know, that's the kind of thing that the MPAA would certainly not back off of if it ended well, up in court somewhere here's the one thing i want to interject uh in the ultraviolet discussion that i think will be cut remember from now on that that ultraviolet is a consortium it's a, it's a format that is still being determined they still haven't figured out like there's chatter about possibly being able to uh to, to actually loan your ultraviolet copy to someone else and then get it back from you some but all, here's the problem is they're still developing the format while individual companies try to market the format, even though it's still not fully determined, and they're all trying to figure out their own benefit and takeaway of Ultraviolet, and nobody is driving the ship on the PR for this thing. And that's why I think it's such a disaster so far. Now, whether or not this means long-term it's going to be a disaster, I think still remains to be determined. But at this moment, nobody knows what it is, and everybody's marketing it differently, and it's not even decided yet, which I think uh, short-term means there's going to be a lot of confusion. It's going to be a bad plan for the, for the short-term. Now, on the other side of the coin, the CW has decided to change its delay of streaming versions of its shows from 75 hours to just eight hours after air. To me, eight hours is perfectly reasonable. Say, look, you know what? We'd rather you watch it live. So we're not going to let you watch it online until it's been on the air 
and it's, you know, eight hours later, then we're going to let you watch it online. So Vampire Diaries, Gossip Girl, all those shows, if you're into them, you can watch them after eight hours uh, later. So 75 hours was just punitive. That was basically saying never catch up with the show. Right. Uh, at least by using online. So question is, now obviously part of the reason is the CAW does this is because their demographics used very, very young. And, and they, they know that, that teenagers are not going to wait 75 hours or whatever the, the limit was. Well, they found that uh, the case, and so I think, I, yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, question, is this an outlier and are other companies going to follow suit? Or is this just a case where, I mean, I assume, I, I, I assume it has to be because as the CW audience gets older, eventually they're going to realize that, that nobody can keep this 75-hour window. But how soon, will there, will there be enough? Another domino next to fall. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, it's, it's impossible to say because it's not based just on reality. It's also based on the perception of the network. I think the CW made this move because they were seeing real significant degradation, right? I don't right. know if there was any knowledge that Nielsen was going to start doing this unified advertising, but that could have swayed them too to say, well, look, we'll be able to like rate this campaign all as one anyway, so we might as well not delay it. Uh, however, I don't know if, you know, when you're talking about CBS, right? CW is part of CBS. Uh, if you're talking about CBS proper, where the audience is much older, whether mm -hmm. they are seeing the kind of degradation that would force their hand or whether they'll be able to tell themselves, no, it would harm us more. Even though I don't believe it would, as long as you're not seeing a significant degradation, you can tell yourself that and not get fired. Right. And yeah, I, that's so what again, all this stuff is about. It's another toe in the water. Uh, a couple of smaller things here in the slipstream, too. Hulu.com uh, did a little redesign. Video player got 55% larger. I mean, you can always make it full screen anyway, but if you wanted to be watching it in line, doing other things, now you got a, you I, got a bigger screen I to suspect, look at. I suspect this is a testimony less to Hulu's investment in its play or anything and more to the, uh, the, the permeation of broadband across America where they feel like they can uh, – because I assume it's got to be bigger bandwidth to have that bigger player unless you just want to show more pixels on there. I don't know. That's a fair question. I, it may be the same resolution. I mean you were already making it full screen, so they had to provide resolution that allowed you to make it full screen. So I, I, right. don't, I don't see that you would be taking up any more bandwidth here. I think they're, I think huh. they're just realizing like, hey, you know what? We have more uh, opportunities for advertisement if they don't make it full screen. So let's give them a bigger picture. That way they are less likely to want to have to make it. Smart on you, Hulu. Yeah. Also, Redbox has a competitor called Digiboo, uh, which is launching in three airports. Ah, scared me. And <laughs> allows you to rent movies via USB drive. So you provide the USB drive. You do have to get it pre-authorized on the internet beforehand, which is a little wonky. But then you just walk up to the Digiboo box, stick your USB drive in, buy your movie rental. It's on your USB stick, board the plane. See, I don't, if you're savvy enough to have a USB drive, then why are you even using this service? This, because This seems like a mushy middle type thing. Uh, Redbox is physical media. Uh, online is, you know, iTunes is by digitally. This is like, well, it's still physical media, but now you don't have to carry a disc. Instead, no, you it's can, not, and it's just as slow. It's actually not physical media. What it is is saying, look, we know the internet in the airport sucks. And if you're in the airport and you decide like, God, I, I, you know what? I wish I had okay, a movie, no, yeah, no, but I can't smart. download that a movie on my laptop. You go to the Digiboo box, plug your USB drive in, boom, you got the movie. At the airport, I do agree that is a special market condition where you're tr you're physically trapped there for this set amount of time you you have a strong need for entertainment when you're on an airplane and the the wi-fi always completely sucks but outside of that i don't know i'm not seeing a lot of opportunity for this yeah man. yeah you may be right about that uh currently windows only as well they do say they got a mac announcement forthcoming and android is promised by june of this year uh we'll, uh, we'll see I, I i don't expect this to be a runaway hit but i think it is an interesting embracing of current technology like look you don't want to be using up your band your uh, your battery with a big old dvd either so this I, i'll tell you what i i think i think we're headed i, I don't i i don't want to get too speculative here with but this is what we do on the show uh i i just really suspect that this is going to be an incredibly exciting year for the kind of stuff we cover on this show because it seems like everything's bubbling 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 and i feel like everything's just going to domino down with a lot of big changes this is i don't want to say that this is going to be our follow the berlin wall year but it's like all of these 
I don't know. It seems like a lot of these stories are happening faster than than they usually do. What well, you know what it is? Yeah, I, I I totally know what you're talking about. Which is things that we've been talking about. Wouldn't it be nice if they just rated everything the same? Wouldn't it be nice if you know Netflix got into original content? Like all of these things are now actually becoming real stories, uh, and we're starting to see like okay, our previous speculation is now playing out in real life. How's it going to work out? Let's move on to tube tops. Yeah, now we're going to speculate about flying cars. Tube tops. <laughs> The new flying cars are out. No, uh, Roku, this is a real, real quick one. Uh, those who are fans of Roku, uh, the Roku 2 and the Roku LT players got a version update to 4.3. Uh, a lot of the tweaks are focused on Netflix, so you should see some faster startup time, improved audio and subtitle settings, optimized performance of screen navigation, uh, improved support for that multiple gaming remotes, stuff like that. So, you know, not, not a big speculation story, but something to let people know if they're using the Roku. And then iFixit has torn down the Apple TV, which is what they do. They take new products and they tear them apart and see what's in them. Turns out that it's not just that you added 1080p video to the new Apple TV. There's also a single-core A5 processor in there. The old Apple TV had an A4 processor, and they found a second antenna, which is possibly for 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, which should improve your wireless behavior. So, so this is a case where they want to... Future products uh, make it so that down the road, if you want to upgrade to Wi-Fi, you can, or with the software update, or like, is is it a case where that antenna is in there, but they're not even supporting it yet? No, the antenna is in there and, and they're using it. It's, they they supported five gigahertz Wi-Fi before, but only on a single antenna. Now you got two antennas. That just makes for better okay. reception. All right, so it's just redundancy. Gotcha. Yeah, it, and this is all hardware as well. Yeah. Uh, Google TV has added international channels. So things like uh, Al Jazeera English, uh, PPTV with Chinese language content, Islam Box, Yup TV, an Indian channel with over five languages supported, Euronews, etc. These are all still for U.S. people. They're, the Google TV is not expanding outside of baby North America. Baby steps, Tom. It's baby steps. Yeah. And you know what, though? And this is the kind of thing that the early adopters like, though. Al Jazeera's uh, service is very popular with a lot of folks. Uh, it's actually a common tactic of young cable network providers. DirecTV and Dish did this in the early days, which is, hey, we've got the Filipino network. We've, right. got, we've got the Chinese, Chinese network, Jade. Uh, and you get a, a, a niche audience that is not being served by anybody else. So it's certainly not a bad idea. I'm not sure it's the thing that saves Google TV, but it's significant. Google TV is going to be fine. Look, they're the empire. They're going to keep throwing rocks until something breaks. Yeah, but the tighter they grip, the more and more networks will slip through their fingers. they got to watch <laughs> that. Uh, Intel has announced and made available the 32 nanometer Atom CE5300 systems on a chip. This will help Google TV devices, hopefully, because the previous Logitech Review and Sony TVs that ran Google TV were using the old Atom chip, and there are a lot of issues with how that chip works. Uh, so in Intel's uh, trying to boost their, their set-top box business, not just for Google TV, obviously, but for any kind of set-top box. Right. And BBC announced the iPlayer now available on Xbox. Not to everyone, though, yeah, right? Yeah, you still have to be in the UK. Yeah, all right. But well, the, UK, the UK folks will be excited about that. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it actually it's, it is important because this, you know, they have a huge install base, and now you can watch your iPlayer uh, in your living room, which, of course, you know, unless you had a, a media PC, you probably weren't doing before. And Microsoft has filed a patent. Now, there's patents filed all the time. It doesn't mean people will actually implement them, but I found this one particularly interesting. Control-based content pricing. Enabling content owners to charge users for skipping over ads or watching a replay. Wait, say that again? If a user initiates a navigation control input to advance past an advertisement, the cost of a requested on-demand movie may be increased. Oh, what a delightful patent that I'm sure will please consumers. Are you kidding me? You jerks. You know, yeah. but here's the th here's the, before you get mad at Microsoft, it's always easy to get mad at Microsoft. Microsoft says because the company filed for the patent, it doesn't mean that they'll see a product 
that uses it anytime soon. And if you've learned anything from patent wars over the past few years, it's incumbent on every company to patent as many things as possible so that when they get sued, they can try to find somebody who's violating one of their patents. So just because right. they figured this out doesn't mean we'll actually see products. And frankly, I can't imagine a product like this ever being successful in the marketplace. Yeah, I agree. However, well, maybe it's a preventative measure where it's like if somebody tries to do it, they're like, nope, we have that patent. And yeah. because we love consumers, we say don't use it. Although, remember, uh, recently Yahoo uh, sued Facebook for social network patents. And Andy Bio said, hey, some of those patents were ones I helped create when I worked there. And they told me they were defensive patents, that we were wow. patenting that so that they would never be abused. And now they're suing Facebook with them. So... You know, corporations aren't always the same personality over time. Yeah, sure. Let's move on. I to guess film. that's it. Film time. Film time. Film time is all about the things you can watch. See, because the slipstream is how you get the programs, and the tube tops is the devices you use to watch the programs, and film film is the programs. And uh, Joss Whedon says, according to Wired that we're going to get a new Dr. Horrible sing-along blog production this summer. Did, did we already know that this was in the works? This is the first time hearing about it. I, I had heard rumors before, but this is the first time I've heard anything official from Whedon. Uh, he says, we are hard on it. It's been a really tough year, couple of years, partially, I'm happy to say, because of work. Uh, and he said that uh, they're trying to get the schedules together. They have a number of songs written. And they want to try to get it together this summer. That is fantastic, dude. What's great about that is like, you know, it's going to be a labor of love because I can't imagine anyone's in it for the money. Yeah, I think it did well monetarily, but you're right. I mean, the last Dr. Horrible well, was I a mean, product of the writer's strike. They just didn't right, have exactly. anything else it's to because ex That's exactly my point. And so it's like when they had nothing to do, they, they probably weren't really doing it for the money the first time around. And it's great that it did well, but but this time they're certainly not doing it for the money because uh, because I'm sure they're all busy and now that the writers strike over, there's plenty of work for them to do. Now, John, let's not play this whole trailer and let's definitely not play it full screen, but go ahead and, uh, and kind of run it in the background. Ridley Scott's Ooh. latest full-length trailer for Prometheus is you out. finally get a taste of what it's all about. Yeah, and this is the first trailer that really shows the story and how it's going to break down. It's a little spoilery, so, you know, don't watch it if you want to come in fresh. But it's the first one that got me more than just like, wow, that looks pretty. It got me excited about the tale they're going to tell here. And then he dies. But think about, think about how much enthusiasm they were able to generate with, with telling virtually nothing about the story outside of like really scott guy who did aliens but this is definitely not aliens but we're definitely going to cut it so it looks like aliens you know we were having an argument on sword and laser about this do you think this is the the, the really scott when he says oh this really isn't a prequel it's just set in the same universe that he's protesting too much because watching this trailer kind of looks like it's a fairly good setup for what's going to happen in Alien, although it's not a direct no, prequel. No, I, I think you will not see you will not see more than 30 seconds of a xenomorph. Um, okay. It's going to be something more like this is this is a precursor race that maybe created the xenomorphs. Or it'll be the most tiny tie in possible and it's going to be its own story. I can't I, I think so. There's also talk of a Tron 3, even though Tron Legacy had its detractors. It was enough of a moneymaker uh, that they're going to do a sequel. And they were at WonderCon promoting, uh, some of the producers were at WonderCon, or Disney, I guess, was at WonderCon, promoting Once Upon a Time uh, and Tron Legacy. Oh, the, the writers, Edward Kitsis and Adam Horowitz, were the ones who told IO9 that, Hey, yeah, there's going to be maybe a Tron 3, and uh, I don't know, maybe Jeff Bridges would be in it. Uh, because Horowitz see, said, I would so say the thing. definition of life and death in the digital realm, and then Kitsis interrupts him, will be explored in the sequel. Yes. Uh, well, and it makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, by the way, have you seen the, the, uh, the trailers for the cartoon that they're doing? It looks really good. Uh-uh. No, I haven't. Yeah, check that out. Go look at the, the Tron, Tron Legacy cartoon that they're doing. And finally, crowdsourced movie studio creates a sci-fi series called New Kind. Yeah, this is like a, this is a cyberpunk anime, uh, I guess, live action kind of thing, or it's all 
all it's all being done in the 3D. The real story here is the quality of the CGI elements. If you scroll down, Jammer B, you can kind of play it in the background and take a look at it. This thing, uh, they're doing a little bit of a Kickstarter so that they can cover their costs. But the idea here is that nowadays kids with a $2,000 computer or $3,000 rig have the capability to create Hollywood-level CGI effects. And these are people who want to break into the industry. So if there's a crowdsourced project where they can say, hey, you get to work on like work a alongside the guy who did textures for the matrix you get to work alongside this guy who choreographed parts of the pod race scene in in you know star wars episode one that uh all of a sudden this is a showcase opportunity for these people and as a result for virtually nothing you're gonna get a gorgeous i can't speak to the quality of the content in here but i do know that that people who are into hardcore cyberpunk anime they want whatever they can get and if they could get something that that looks this slick uh uh, there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm from the anime community. Well, top-tier digital artists, the folks who worked on things like Avatar, who worked on things like Hugo, are po are pooling their talents with this because they just love the genre. They just want to they they want to make this kind of content. And this is the kind of thing you see examples of this all the time that gives the lie to the idea that our our laws do not protect us enough to create to en enforce creativity. We want to be creative anyway. Copyright yes. law should be minimally protective, not maximally protective, because we want to create stuff. I, th this is actually a subgenre that I think might explode, which is the folks who are really pros at doing visual effects, doing set design, doing animatronics, they don't work constantly. They don't, they're not always on the job. And when they're not on the job, they start fooling around with stuff on their own. The internet, things like Kickstarter, provide them outlets that they never had before. And that right. I know plenty of people like this who are saying, you know, I've got my own little project that I kind of work on in my off time that I want to get together and put out there as, uh, a as an actual movie or as, a as an actual film that I'm just making myself. And if that starts happening more and more, you're going to see a lot of really high quality independent productions. Yeah, and I think that I think you're right. This provides a focus for whereas they might just be tinkering and maybe it'll be something that shows up in their demo reel uh, update. If they could do that same amount of tinkering and have a finished project that they can show around to other people, I think that uh, a lot of professionals are going to be excited to do it. Let's move on to premiering this week. Premiering this week. This is what's premiering this week. Check it out. And what's premiering this week, of course, is the hunger games uh which yeah. is uh mass is going to be a mass in fact I'm, I'm sad we're not doing the movie draft already because this is going to be a high dollar movie well you realize it's in the movie draft we're doing the movie draft tonight and so this is the oh, first it is. item You're right it's the SFW first check. It's the first item in the movie draft. Oh, it wow. Is, now, that's be, interesting. Okay, so the NSFW Show Frame Rate Summer Movie Draft kicks off tonight on NSFW Show. Correct. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the draft, uh, Justin and Robert Young, Brian Brushwood, and guests will take $100, bucks, whatever they want to call them, and right. bid for movies. And you can only buy as many movies as, as you can do in the auction with your 100 bucks, And then... You get points for every domestic gross dollar those movies make, and the one who has the most points at the end wins. Correct. Correct. Now, but it doesn't just end there, because the number one complaint we get is, oh, I wish I could have played along. So here's the thing. Uh, if you are hearing it this week, then either if, if you've already missed our bidding, you could go to draft.nsfwshow.com. That's draft.nsfwshow.com. And you can see what the six of us paid for all of the movies. And then you can enter your own league. There'll be a link on there that allows you to click. You can buy at the same market rates. You can figure out like, oh, Brian way overpaid for this. Tom underpaid for this. You can pick, figure out which ones are the best bargains. And you compete against all the other members of Chat Realm. Last, last time we had over 500 competitors from Chat Realm. There'll be a tight window and we're going to have to close it before the Hunger Games premieres this Friday. But it's so much fun because all of a sudden you have a in the race you get to follow along with the movies and you find yourself rooting for movies that you personally hate but that you hope make a billion dollars so that you can stick it to everyone else so um, start it's way way fun starting with the hunger games uh this week and going all the way through august 17th with the expendables 2 and paranorman <laughs> uh we will have uh we'll have a dog in the hunt every week from somebody it'll be myself 
uh, Justin Robert Young, Brian, Veronica Belmont, Sarah Lane, and Scott Johnson in the uh, in the pool yes. this week. And then you get so to buy based on our bid amounts. So, so, so uh, obviously we don't have time to go through all of the movies, but let's go through the highlights. Obviously, the Hunger Games right out of the gates. This is this is the earliest we're ever starting the league because uh, Hunger Games is going to be such a huge hit. Um, also, Wrath of the Titans next week. Now, two years ago when we first did it, the number one purchase in the entire game was Clash of the Titans. I remember, I think Jason got it for uh, for twelve dollars, and it ended up making like one hundred and thirty million dollars or something like that. It was the biggest bargain in the entire game. We also have a uh, Cabin in the Woods, which uh, is a big question mark because that, of course, is the Joss Whedon project. Three Stooges is a known property, but I don't know how much money it's going to make. Do you know anything about Lockout? Uh, no, just that it's kind of a geeky film. Uh, you know, it, at best, it's probably got a chance to be a, a secret or surprise hit, but probably not. Right. Uh, the Raven, the Avengers. Yeah, I think this whole summer is going to be about uh, the, Aven- the Avengers versus the Dark Knight. Which of those is going to be the biggest, uh, the biggest movie? Well, and here's uh, the thing. In the past two drafts, we had the winter movie draft. There was a Twilight movie. And in the last summer movie draft, there was a Harry Potter movie. Those were right. by far and away the biggest grocers. And if you got those, you won. Sarah Lane had Harry Potter. She won. I had Twilight in the winter movie draft. I won. I don't see the one movie that does it to you this year. Now, Sarah argued when I told, said this uh, yesterday that The Dark Knight is that movie this year but the hunger so. games and avengers are both going to gross high dollar amounts as well but here's the other thing look how spread out th- spread out they are you've got the hunger games in march two months later you got the avengers two months after two months after that you have the dark knight rises there's no reason all of these can't make 300 million a piece and then you got to fill in with the other stuff so if the, if, if those all make similar amounts of money yeah. then then it's like so okay have well a big, who got uh, pixar who got Snow White and the Huntsman and did it do well? Who got Battleship and did it surprise? You know, right. uh, it's not about what movies you think are good. Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, I can't wait to see. Probably not going to gross that much. Correct. You know? So you got you to be wary of that sort of stuff. So here's the other one. So we got The Avengers is going to be a big one because think about it. The Avengers is essentially either a second or third movie for five different franchises, yeah, right? And it's, All, how, yeah. Talk about being promoted. At the end of every one of these movies, there has been a little teaser to The Avengers. I mean, it, nerds are, are dying to see this movie. Yes, exactly. But you also have, you've got Men in Black 3, which, and, and uh, sequels tend to do better because we know they're safe bets. They tend to make a, a lot of good money. Men in Black 3 now, uh, it's the third in the franchise, but it's also been a long time since we've had a lot of excitement about Men in Black. Um, of course, there's been a lot of buzz about Snow White and the Huntsman. Uh, Madagascar 3 is another prequel. And it, kids movie too. Or another sequel, but they brought... And it, Again, kids' movies, kids' movies gets a bonus. Prometheus is the big question mark. I yeah. think Prometheus will will uh, will be this year's uh, Inception because I won the very first year because I bet heavily and bought Inception and nobody expected it to run away the way it did. I think Prometheus has the chance to do that because it's from a, a established director who has a lot of blockbusters under his belt and it's a franchise that I think people are going to like. Um, what else? Brave is an, a Pixar movie. Pixar movies tend to do very, very well. And you got a sequel with G.I. Joe Retaliation. I don't know. Does This is a third movie in the franchise. Yeah. Did, I, I mean, I think it makes this? money, but it's not making huge money. Well, another question mark is The Amazing Spider-Man. Are Absolutely. people going to be tired of the hero movies by the end of the summer when this comes out? July 3rd. Well, it's midsummer, I guess. And it's a reboot. Uh, yes. You know, uh, so this isn't the Jake Gyllenhaal of Spider-Man. Uh, keep in, uh, well, there, there never was a Jake Gyllenhaal spider Oh, no, wait, who, there what, was who, a who, Toby McGuire. Why do I, I always do that? I, I <laughs> Toby confuse McGuire, Toby Batman. McGuire and Jake Gyllenhaal. I apologize to both of them. Uh, Toby uh, McGuire is Spider Man. You got another sequel with Ice Age, which is another kids movie, and another sequel, which might be a safe bet. Uh, Dark Knight, of course, is huge. Born Legacy, another another sequel. Now, did you even know that there was a reboot of Total Recall? Yeah, I thought or, we even uh, talked about it on Frame Rate at one point that this was coming, but I didn't realize it was coming so soon. Uh, All right, now here's an. Here's another X factor, Sparkle. The this Whitney is one Houston. when Dan Dirk sent out the original uh, list, Sparkle was not in here. And I said, and he asked, like, are there any movies you think should be here? I'm like, we ha- that, that's not a geek movie. I understand that, but it's got Whitney Houston in it. Right. It's going to be huge. Well, 
And, and, and just look at what happened with Michael Jackson's This Is It. This Is It was destined to be a straight-to-DVD documentary. And then, of course, when Michael Jackson died, uh, I think it did close to $100 million in the in the theaters. It did, it did well enough that uh, Sparkle might be an interesting bargain. And uh, I'm already – I've been seeing ads for Paranorman since, uh, what, uh, December. Really? I mean, almost a year in advance of it. They're pushing that one pretty hard. Well, there you go. Summer movie draft, as we mentioned, uh, will happen on NSFW show this evening. If you're uh, watching Frame Rate Live, it'll be on at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, or you can watch it on demand. Uh, and then hop into the uh, draft.nsfwshow.com quickly and uh, get your own entry in there before The Hunger Games comes out on Friday. Let's uh, move on to what we're watching. watching so i've been watching being human you've been watching the lorax that's about covers it right anything else interesting uh nothing else significant or interesting happened this week so uh is it time for feedback <laughs> no, <I'm t> <laughs> uh should the, the question is should we hold our walking dead discussion to a spoiler zone yeah let's take it to the spoiler zone stick around after the credits if you want uh the spoiler zone and How we'll was talk the about lorax? it uh you know what it was very safe and it was i felt dirty because um, this is why Hollywood makes so much money on bland properties is because you got kids and it just changes it. It's like I wanted to go see John Carter of Mars. I was excited about it, but I found myself sitting there with stupid glasses on watching the Lorax in 3D because my daughter wanted to see it and it was big and colorful and it was very bland. I found myself weirdly. There's a part where, where the Onceler starts selling his th the needs and he sings this uh, this rock song about how bad he is as the capitalist and there's part of me like yeah man you are a badass you got a product that people want good on you and so uh i don't know it was, it was interesting it was heavy-handed but you're I all pro-capitalist when you're watching yeah. the lorax yeah exactly i i did love uh, uh hearing danny devito as the lorax because especially once you've seen what what an awful person he plays on always sunny in philadelphia it made it all the more hilarious to see him as a sanctimonious environmentalist well, I did, I did a lot of catching up this week. We watched uh, The Office. We watched some 30 Rock. And, you know, we're behind on both those shows. But I, I tell you what, being human on the Sci-Fi Network, the American version of it, uh, it's starting to outpace the British version. And I loved the UK being human. But this one is more about people being bad. The UK yeah. version was sort of an allegory for drug addiction and people in the grip of something they couldn't control. And they feel more like victims of their own... Uh, inner turmoil whereas being human two of the three characters now are just being bad and they're not victims of their own inner turmoil they have chosen to be bad and they're not fighting it and that is making it much more interesting and you're wondering is that third character going to go that way as well so uh, I highly recommend that as well let's move on to feedback now sorry, it's time no, no. for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Rate oh yeah it was like a head fake in basketball. I, was, I wasn't even looking. It was a sneak I was like, attack. Oh, and feedback. Uh, yes, we got feedback uh, from Andros, who says, Dear Pinky and the Brain, and Jason and Tony edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about Danger 5 on frame rate. It looked great. I saw the first few episodes and loved it. On Wednesday, I was poking around on an Australian TV website and saw an ad for Danger 5, 9.30 p.m. Sundays curious i clicked it and was quite surprised danger five was not a web series it was a full-blown tv show it cut up episode zero and pulled them out as five minute youtube clips before its season began i'm glad the show got a chance but i'm now disappointed because as someone not living with kangaroos and didgeridoos i'm going to have to obtain it <laughs> So I think this is a really good, interesting question. Like, like, uh, are, were you disappointed to find out it was a real show? Because there was some part of me that that thought, uh, when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, this is delightful. Only on YouTube could this kind of thing happen. Because what could the market for this possibly be? And then I could understand his betrayal, but it shouldn't matter. If you're judging it based on its own merit, it shouldn't ma matter if it came from uh, TV money or came from YouTube money or was an independent program. But I think it does matter, and it shouldn't. You know what? It doesn't matter for your enjoyment of the content. You should still be able to go, you know what? That's great. And good on the Danger 5 guys for making something awesome. Who cares if it was made for TV or web at all? But it is disappointing for me as an example of the rise of web video. It's like, nope, not an example of that at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Yes, exactly. So I, we, we feel your pain, Andros. 
Uh, this one comes from Alan in Manchester. He says, I know I won't be the only one to write in and say this, but I actually had to jump back and rewatch a section of Frame Rate 67 when I heard you talking about Misfits on Hulu. From your description, you seem to imply that Misfits is a web-based property and that networks considering trying to rework it is a triumph for web video. Video, but I feel it is important to keep in mind that Mis Misfits is a Channel 4 property, one of the largest broadcasters in the UK. And while it was originally a cable show, not technically broadcast, it was created by a group that is definitely old media. I think I think we knew that. We're we sorry did. If we gave this this is not as, as horrible as the previous example. We did know this was Channel 4, but it's similar to Lilyhammer. Lilyhammer right. was made by a Norwegian broadcast company and is broadcast on television in Norway. Misfits is the same way. It's new to right. us. And and I think that's right. just what? as cool that they're saying, hey, this is a television show in this country, but when we bring it to this country, we're going to make it available on Netflix or make it yeah, available on Hulu. Traditionally, the only way we would get to see Misfits is if somebody bought it after its release and decided to rebroadcast it in the United States. And so we're very excited that uh, that they're making it directly available to us. And, and, and Alan's right for writing in and making us clarify that because I think we did gloss over that. So apology, yeah. apologies for that. Uh, finally, oh wait, not quite finally. Uh, no, this, this could be final. Jay are from Trinidad and Tobago. As you might expect, I am not able to get hold of a lot of online content because of my location. My question is why? I understand that sports is locked or blacked out of a region to encourage people to go to the stadium or shows that depend on ad revenue only showing in the market where they are advertising. However, what is the motivation for a movie studio restricting its movies to particular countries? Wouldn't it be to the movie studio's advantage to sell their movies to the largest audience possible? Please explain. Uh and the, well, and the answer is they want to make as much money as possible and people pay for the opportunity to have an exclusive. So it's like they've got to respect that and they've got to divvy up the regions. And that's that's how they make their money in it. At least that's how I understand it. Tom, do you have well, any more insight? Uh, that may be part of it. Another part of it is the fact that schedules are different in different parts of the world. Uh, and movie releases are different in different parts of the world because they're more or less popular. So in India, for instance, there are tons of movies coming out every week that we don't ever see in the United States. And so if you're going to release Prometheus in India, you have to look at the Bollywood schedule and say, well, I don't want to go up against that because that's going to be really popular and it's going to cut into my ticket sales. So I'm going to release it on this date. But that date may not correspond to where you want to release it in the United States. So these different markets, different kinds of movies change when it's best to launch it in that region. Now, that used to, it used to be a zero-sum game. I could hold on to a movie for a year and not hurt because nobody in France was going to go fly to the United States and see it. Or if they did, it wasn't in such large numbers that it mattered. The internet has changed that calculation. So now if I am going to release a big blockbuster in India and I'm worried about going up against a Bollywood movie, I still have to keep in mind that I don't want to delay it too long because then people will start to find other ways to watch it. Right, correct. So it's, yeah, this is an artifact of a changing landscape and I'm sure that you will continue to hear stories of, of how this changes here on Frame Rate. Um, all right, we're going to wrap things up and that is uh, it for spoilers. this episode of Frame Rate, except for the spoiler zone that we'll be doing after the credits. So if you don't want to be spoiled about Walking Dead, you can stop now. Uh, if not, keep listening. Frame Rate Show at gmail.com is the place to email us your thoughts and your comments and your criticisms, all of them, in one email if you want. We'll see you later. Walking Dead season finale. Brian Brushwood, what did you think? Uh, hey. What'd so, you, what'd uh, you think? I, I think, I think I, I stick to my guns. Uh, Walking Dead, you get a one season pass on, on your jumbled mishmash of a season. I'm not holding this against you. I'm going to remain and wait. I think it's very, very telling that the two most exciting elements of this episode. We're directly, we're directly getting back on track with the 
comics. I think it's been a delightful experience so far to say, oh, what if Shane was kept alive? What if this? What if that? But now it's like, what did it change having Shane be alive for that season? Nothing. You just ended up having the same scene but later in the episode. And as a result, you wasted a whole season sitting around farting and talking and crying on the farm. But when it came down to it, we saw two things. We saw the prison, which they made a big deal about. And we saw Michonne, who looked awesome and badass. My prediction is uh, is that they're going to get a lot closer to following the comic with one change. I'm convinced that they're going to find the prison, but it's going to be occupied by the governor. That's My- interesting. That's interesting thought. I, I agree with you. I didn't have the highs and lows this season that you did, but it was definitely a slow decline all season. And I was cheering. I was up out of my seat when I saw Michonne walk up oh, because she's one of my favorite characters in the comic book. And, I, and Eileen's looking at me like, what are you so excited about this weird hooded person? I was like, no, but you don't understand. Like that's, yeah. And then we're seeing her a little earlier than we would in the comic book. And that's awesome. And I like that change. And then when they showed the prison, I was like, oh, yeah, we're going there next. That is fantastic. Now, you, they were still in the prison when they met the governor. So it's quite possible that that stays the same, but that's an interesting thought that he's in the prison as well. That could work. I wouldn't mind that change. Yeah. Uh, I do uh, like the change, too, that I I was talking about after I watched this, that Rick has already made uh, a pivot on his his behavior earlier than he does in the book, and I'm fine with that. And in fact, Carl hasn't made quite as dramatic of a pivot as he does in the book. And I'm fine with that because that can lead to something down the road because the difference between the show and the comic book, in the comic book, what happens to Shane happens to him much earlier. They're still camped outside Atlanta. And Rick is sort of bewildered and trying to talk Shane down. And Shane is like, no, this is the way it has to be. And Carl steps in and out of anger and fear for his father takes down Shane. In, In the television show, we get a different... We get a different take, which is Rick has now turned bad, not not evil, but like well, not, not you know bad, what? Just, just... I've got to do this. I'm I'm fine. I'm I give in on trying to always do the 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 hundred percent right thing. I'm going to do what needs to be done, and I, I'm going to defend it. And and we see that play out in this last episode when he's justifying it, and they're all looking at him, and he's like, "This is not a democracy anymore." That's something that doesn't come until later in the book. But I I'm fine. This is a different Rick. You know, this is alternate Rick, and it's an right. alternate Rick that's interesting, and and it leaves Carl to develop a little slower over time so uh i i think uh another interesting element will be uh, you remember there's a certain relationship that develops with michonne i wonder if uh if t-dog is going to be a stand-in for the character in the comic book uh i, for, I forgot his uh Ty- tyrese oh that was- yeah that he could they could because uh, i felt bad for that actor like he hardly got any lines his character didn't get any story development over the entire Dude, are you season kidding me? That, that that actor went into this gig thinking, oh, here's a character that's not at all in the comic book. I'll be around for a few episodes. And then two seasons in, he's like, hey, hey, I'm still in. I'm still in. And they're killing off major characters. Maybe maybe I'll still be here. Yeah, maybe I'll finally get some substantial thing to sink my teeth into one of these seasons. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I do I do feel like in the, in the finale, uh, I thought it was idiotic how oh, all over the map Lori... Uh, Lori's reaction was where she's all like one episode you're like you know you don't understand you gotta take out Shane you gotta be the man you gotta be in charge and then he does exactly that and she's like you're crazy get away from my boy and she does those Lori crazy eyes yeah, which he, that actress has the best Lori crazy eyes she definitely does and I think that that is a uh, I think my theory is what we've seen over this season is the Walking Dead creative staff the writers and the producers sort of navigating on a moving boat you know, trying trying to get it under control. Uh, it got knocked out of the water when Frank Darabont left, and they've just been you know steering like crazy, crazy. And they finally brought it into port at the end yes. of the season, and they're like, okay, now we know where we're going. And I I think that what you're seeing, what you're talking about with Lori, was a, a side effect of that, where every individual scene that Lori did made sense, but it just didn't make sense in the whole. Uh, and 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 so hopefully that will go away in the next season now that they've they've kind of settled down a little bit. Did you see the bizarre courtship that they did after the the Walking Dead trying to get those people interested in Mad Men? Did you see that promo? Oh, I love that promo. You didn't like that? I just thought it was funny. Um I I don't know if it was meant to be funny or actually try to court or whatever. It was really odd because it was clearly I I don't know if it was an inside joke for people who already loved Mad Men or if it was just like, if it was a serious like, no, if you like Walking Dead, you'll 
probably like Mad Men because look, and it does all these parallels. Oh, it's, no, it's a total joke. Know. Having watched all the seasons of Mad Men, uh, it, yeah. it is not. They're they are making no connection between those two shows. In fact, that's what's hilarious about it, and that's why you're not getting it because you don't watch the show. Well, so I, I've like, watched the first it, season, but, and, uh, but all they're I, saying is like, you know, like, hey, they walk like zombies because they're drunk. Get it? Ha ha ha. There, yeah, okay. there is, and anybody who's a big fan of Mad Men knows, like, no, there's there's no similarity between these two shows. So that's what that's funny. Is that they're they're pretending? I don't know. I, I think if, if if it was a joke, I think it might have been a little bit of a too high minded concept. I, really? Because oh, I disagree. Well, I, I, I thought it, I, I, Eileen okay. and I both thought they were funny. They were just throwaways. Like, it, well, I, the only people who would get it are people who are already watching Mad Men. In which case, why are you putting that out there? I mean, I don't know. I think you're overthinking it, it a little. Yeah, man, probably so. Probably so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that is it for the frame rate spoiler zone. Uh, thank you all. For watching, listening, and uh, finding us at our new time. Don't forget, Frame Rate is live at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday mornings. Brian has to take a call, so we'll see you later.